Okay, well, um, first of all, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Gold. I'll be chairing this seminar on European Works Council's The Effects of Brexit. Um, the, reason, uh, the reason for having this seminar now is that the UK left the European Union almost exactly three years ago in January 2021. And of course, the effects on trade patterns, migration, labour supply, we know about. But in particular, from a trade union's point of view, the issue is, well, at least one of the issues, is on European Works Councils. Because under the directives from 1994 and 2009, European Works Councils directives set up um, pan-European Works Councils that represent workers across the EU member states and indeed other, other countries as well, if they have interests in the European Union. Now, the issue is whether employers are using Brexit to roll back those rights. That's the, the, the key issue. Um, and in particular, how are unions reacting to that? Because European Works Councils cover about 40% of eligible companies. So they are a, a, a very significant aspect of European worker representation. Now, in this online seminar, uh, we welcome Catherine Barnard and also Jonathan Hayward, two internationally recognised experts on European Works Councils. Um, and Catherine will talk about the legal aspects and Jonathan will then follow with a talk about the practical aspects of Brexit. Uh, before um, introducing the two speakers, though, I just want to make a few quick points. First of all, a particularly warm welcome to you if you haven't been to one of these history and policy forum meetings before, or indeed if you're from outside London or from overseas. Uh, one advantage of Zoom seminars is, of course, we can improve our range dramatically from London and the home counties to take in many more people than otherwise be here. And I would also take this opportunity to thank John Edmonds and, and Philip Murphy, the Director of History and Policy, for their help in setting up this, this seminar anyway. Now, I'm chairing it on behalf of the Trade Union Employment Forum, which is part of History and Policy. Now, um, this is a Zoom seminar, so there might be the occasional problem, hopefully not. If I suddenly lose connection, um, I'll turn my video off because that sometimes improves things. And if I lose connection completely, I'll hand over to, to, to John Edmonds, who's kindly agreed to step in. However, I hope that won't happen. Um, we'd be grateful if you could mute your microphone whilst other people are speaking to prevent background noise or a disruption. Um, each speaker will have about 30 minutes, um, so we'll have a good time for discussion. And we hope to finish in total by about 7.30 this evening. Um, if you'd like to make a, uh, a contribution or like to speak, then at the end, please let me know by raising your hand. You can either do it physically or you can um, uh, you can go, go into one of these um, icons at the bottom. I think there's one called reactions where you can put your hand up and I'll take people in order. Uh, if there's a lot of questions, comments, what I might do is take a few together. So that'll streamline the answers. Um, another point I should just make is that this is being recorded um, just to let you know. Um, if you have any objections or problems with that, then please say now, otherwise it'll go ahead. Um, so let me now introduce briefly our two speakers, um, who we are particularly grateful to for taking time out of their busy schedules for giving this talk. First of all, we have Catherine Barnard, who will be speaking on Brexit and the legal challenges facing European Works Councils. Catherine has been Professor of EU Law and Employment Law at Trinity College, Cambridge since 2008, and is the author of many widely regarded publications, including European Union Law 2020, amongst many th a lot else, and is also senior fellow on the UK in the Changing Europe project. And you may have heard her on the radio or indeed on the television talking about it, Brexit. Um, Catherine has to leave at around 6.20. So what I'll do after her talk, I'll take any specific questions to her so she can answer those before her departure. But then we have Jonathan Haywood, um, who you will see also on your screen, who will speak on Brexit and the practical challenges facing European Works Councils. And Jonathan is International Officer at Unite the Union and has extensive knowledge of this area, um, has negotiated numerous European Works Council agreements under various EU, EU uh, member state laws, including more recently under Irish law, uh, as a result of the impact of Brexit. And he also acts as a trade union expert and coordinator to a number of European Works Councils on behalf of the European Trade Union Federations, um, including uh, European Works Council at Europe, at the International Airlines Group, GE Aviation and Swissport. So without further ado from me, 
um, I'm going to hand over to Catherine for her talk. Catherine. <clears throat> Thank you very much for those kind words. I'd like to share my screen, but I need to be made a host. Could um, Philip kindly make me a host? Oh, you've just been made a host. I, okay, I think you've done you. that. Can you can you see the screen as a whole? Yes, we can. Thank you, Catherine. That's okay, great. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, uh, I realise that the title of my talk is already rebarbative and indeed will put off um, anyone who's not a lawyer. Um, for those who are not lawyers, you, it, my talk will confirm all the reasons why um, you think lawyers are a very bad thing. Um, but unfortunately, um, because of the technicalities around Brexit, um, it required quite a lot of legal heavy lifting. Now, I will try and explain as clearly as I can. Um, one of the things that UK Changing Europe does is to try and encourage people to communicate their subject in, a, in an accessible way. But um, as you'll see, it is quite technical. But rest assured, you've got Jonathan to follow who will give you um, excitement, case studies and all the things that make um, these seminars worthwhile. So let me just start um, from the beginning. Just get the slides to move across. Um, so just briefly, pre-Brexit, um, the UK did implement the um, Works Council Directive through um, what are known as the TICE regulations, uh, the Transnational Information Consultation of Employees Regulations 99. And it's worth bearing in mind that actually there was quite a presence of EWCs, no doubt thanks to Jonathan's hard work, um, in the UK, um, and it's worth bearing in mind too that approximately one in eight European Works Councils had their headquarters in the UK, um, and about one in four um, with the headquarters outside the European Economic Area, so that's the EU plus um, uh, Norway, Liechtenstein and Iceland, had nominated their UK um, subsidiary as their representative under the regs. Now, clearly, Brexit was going to change all of that because um, in Regulation for 1 and 5, we thought it was all dependent on having um, your central management um, uh, situated in the UK. And Regulation 5 says the central management is, was, uh, responsible for creating the conditions necessary to set up a works council or an information and consultation procedure and then lays down the criteria that you know 1,000 employees, 150 employees in at least each of at least two member states. So what happens happened when the UK was no longer a member state? So that takes me to Ewer. EUA 2018. So EUA is the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, really important piece of legislation. And it was essentially drafted in anticipation of a no deal Brexit, but applied even when we did exit the EU with a deal. And the reason I want to just draw your attention to EUA is because um, the basic idea behind EUA was that everything must stay. In other words, all EU law, which pre -ex existed prior to Brexit Day, all EU law would be transferred across and dumped onto the UK statute book. And that went by the rather unattractive title of retained EU law. And that EU law included things like the TICE regulations, the ones I've just mentioned, but also really important legal principles, including the so-called general principles of law, the principle which would include effective application of EU law, the principle of supremacy of EU law, which means if there's a conflict between EU law and national law, EU law would prevail. And that was retained despite uh, all of the arguments of the Brexiteurs, and also all of pre-Brexit case law would continue. 
And so if you want this in diagrammatic form, what you saw was that the 2018 Act introduced this category called retained EU law, and it saved the um, TICE regulations, it saved the general principles, and it saved all of the case law. Now, you might be wondering why I'm telling you any of this. What's the relevance? Well, the key point was that it preserved everything as was really sensible um, because um, the UK wanted a functioning statute book on the day after Brexit Day. But while that was the basic principle underpinning the legislation, um, there was separate legislation correcting um, UK legislation to make sure that it would accommodate post-Brexit um, needs. And of course, because of the um, gateway provisions in Regulation 4 and 5 about undertaking situated in the UK, those had to be amended. And they were amended by this rather unattractively named uh, regulations, the Employment Rights Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019-535. And those regulations, which are there, you can find them on the um, government website, those regulations tweaked but didn't repeal all of the earlier 1990, uh, 1999 regulations. And what I just want to draw your attention to is that if you see here, there was an amendment to Regulation 4, and in particular, um, an amendment to Regulation 5 about deleting the words, the central management initiates. You'll see why I'm emphasising that in a moment. To summarise where I've got up to, because I know it's um, quite a lot of um, information, Ewer took carried over and ensured that the TICE regulations 99 carried on applying, but part of them were amended and they were amended by this uh, statutory instrument. And as you can see, it's pretty hard going to read. And what you're going to see in a moment, I hope, is that the government screwed up. This was an example of legislate in haste and repent at leisure. There was a cock up and um, the cock-up led to the EasyJet litigation, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. At the time, so when these regulations, 2019 regulations were introduced and uh, amended the 1999 regulations, um, as you can see, Louis Silkin, who've done some good writing on all of this, um, said um, what we see, the effect of these 2019 um, regulations is the end, uh, they end the right of employees to request information on whether their employer falls within the scope of the directive. Um, and if so, if the employer falls within the scope, request the establishment of the, EV, the European Works Council, all of that's gone. It also ends the application of the UK's 1999 legislation to UK based business or non-EU based business that had a designated representative agent in the UK before Brexit. But what the, because it was a partial turning off, as you saw, they corrected, changed bits, particularly regulations four and five, but not the whole thing. What the regulations did preserve were the protections in the 1999 regulations from uh, workers, representatives, being um, uh, suffering detriment and suffering from unfair dismissal. Now, you might think, gosh, this is really um, unnecessarily complicated. And of course, it was made more complicated, and I'm sure Jonathan will go into this, about the fact that, of course, um, the regulations did preserve the application of the UK's um, 1999 legislation in circum certain circumstances, um, uh, um, and those were the circumstances that you can see um, uh, outlined there. So you've got the legislation, 
it um, protects worker representatives, it continues to protect worker representatives, but certainly no new worker representatives and no new um, European Works Council um, could be set up under UK law because, of course, the UK was no longer in the EU. Now, this brings me to the EasyJet litigation. And the EasyJet litigation is the only piece of litigation that I'm aware of on these um, regulations. And the reason why I've talked you through the different um, stages is because it will help you, I hope, to understand the EasyJet litigation. So what happened was that EasyJet, as many of you know, has its central management based in the UK. And prior to Brexit, um, it operated under the TICE regulations, specifically under the default or subsidiary rules, the ones, if you know the directive, which are contained in the annex. Now, um, it obviously had the U UK um, as its base, and it knew about the Commission guidance. The Commission wrote guidelines um, for works councils, both European works councils, both UK-based and non-UK-based, about how to um, respond to Brexit. And what EasyJet did, following on from the Commission guidance, was to um, appoint a German representative agent to take on its uh, Works Council responsibilities in Germany, and that's just what it did. So it essentially, as the Commission recommended, essentially said we've got now a German-European Works Council. Now, um, the EasyJet UK European Works Council complained to the CAC, the Central Arbitration Committee, about the fact that EasyJet had failed to inform and consult the EasyJet UK European Works Councils on various restructuring proposals. And EasyJet, rather understandably, in the light of what I've just explained and in the light of the Commission's guidance, said, well, we don't actually have to um, consult the um, uh, UK European Works Council because the TICE regulations no longer apply to um, the uh, UK European Works Council because um, its central management was situated in the UK and as we've seen because its central management was situated in the UK the TICE regulations, the 1990 regulations um, didn't apply is what EasyJet said and therefore there was a legal point, technical point, therefore the CAC didn't have jurisdiction, it could, which means that is legal language, it couldn't actually hear the case. Um, in fact, the CAC um, agreed um, with the UK European Works Council, EasyJet appealed to the EAT, um, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and then EasyJet appealed again to the Court of Appeal. And um, their arguments were as follows. Brexit means Brexit. They didn't quite put it in those terms, but that's essentially what they were saying. I, we have left the um, EU and therefore we shouldn't be subject to uh, the European Works Council directive anymore. More pragmatically, and this argument did appeal to the Court of Appeal, it's unworkable to have to operate a UK-based European Works Council and a German-based European Works Council. It's unworkable to have both. Furthermore, because of the turning off of the parts of the 1999 regulations, um, uh, so, and sorry, and partly because of Brexit, there's no national law in the member states on how you elect worker representatives um, of a European Works Council operating under UK law, because, of course, most member state laws were premised on worker representatives being in um, a member state of the EU. And furthermore, EasyJet said, we're worried that if we end up having to have two European Works Councils, 
one UK based and one German based, the national law on, for example, the protection of confidential information may be different. And if it's released, if it's allowed, the information can be provided in, say, the UK, but not in Germany. And that information is then shared in, with the German European Works Council. Um, there is a risk that they could be prosecuted as a result and imprisonment might follow. Now, there's very little evidence of that so far, but that's what they were worried about. And indeed, the Court of Appeal took it on board. Lewis Silkin um, represented EasyJet in the case, and there's a very useful blog if you would like to know more. The effect of the litigation was that um, the um, Court of Appeal found in favour of the EasyJet European Works Council rejected EasyJet's appeal. The Court of Appeal basically said in polite legal terms that the current state of the law is a dog's breakfast. And this was because um, Regulation 4 and 5 are contradictory. Regulation 4, do you remember Regulation 4? I'll just take you back so you've seen it before. Regulation 4 says um, that uh, the legislation applies to a situation where the central management of the community scale undertaking is situated in the UK. And Regulation 5 says the central management is responsible for creating the conditions for setting up a European Works Council. You might recall when I talked you through it that Regulation 5 was turned off by the 2019 regs. And that was the basis on which EasyJet said, well, we don't have to comply with the obligations under the, um, the 1999 regs because um, the UK is no longer a member state. And so I've summarised what I've just said to you orally here. There's the language in the first paragraph. There's the language from Regulation 4. There's the language in Regulation 5. And as you can see, some employers, like EasyJet, understood that a business whose central management is situated in the UK, then the rest of the 99 regs don't apply to them. Now, the... Um, Court of Appeal said this is merely a deeming provision, and they actually said the relevant provision is Regulation 4. So the effect of the Court of Appeal's decision, as you can see um, there, is that European Works Councils of UK-based businesses, which were established in the UK before the end of the Brexit transition period, I pre the end pre Brexit, I pre the 30th, 31st of December 2020, um, those subsidiary requirements in the 99 regs continue to exist. Even though the Court of Appeal said that the amended regulations are possibly not the best thought through piece of legislation. That's polite way of saying they're a dog's breakfast. And they also accepted, the Court of Appeal also accepted that um, the its decision would cause significant practical difficulties, i.e. those practical difficulties which um, I listed for you here. Um, the Lord Justice um, Davis also said, rather intriguingly, um, that the directive no longer governs the operation of the existing European Works Council in the UK. He goes on to say the purposes of the directive are of little re relevance to the European Works Council, which is governed by the provisions of TISA, that's the 1999 regs, which is English law. And therefore, the, that, those provisions require the existing European Works Council to continue existence. And so the significance of the directive falls away. Now, I'm not so sure about that, whether he's absolutely got that right. But for a reason I'll explain in a moment. But just to say, remember this, the EasyJet case was about um, one factual scenario. And that factual scenario was um, a UK based um, company um, having a European Works Council operating under the subsidiary requirements. What happens if you've got a European Works Council operating under an agreement as opposed to under the subsidiary requirements? Um, and there are various other permutations. 
Um, there are a couple more cases coming down the line, so we'll see how they proceed. Um, but it does raise very practical problems for European Works Councils and companies like EasyJet, how to manage two separate European Works Councils with different sets of legal rules applying. Now, further complication is that, of course, in the uh, the UK implemented the um, uh, European Works Council Directive in 1999. As we know, there is going to be new European Works Council legislation. I was told it was going to be published. The text was going to be published on the 16th, but I haven't actually seen it. I don't know if Jonathan's seen the revised text. Um, on the 16th of January, but I haven't. I, I had a look around last night to see if I could find it, but it hasn't. But it looks like it's coming. And of course, once that new European Works Council legislation is being um, adopted, you'll have further divergence between the TICE Regulations 99 and whatever comes out in the new European Works Council Directive, which it serves to exacerbate the problem that the Court of Appeal flagged up about how to manage two separate European Works Councils. Final thing I want to say, if your mind has not been blown enough or if you haven't um, dozed off um, in sheer boredom at all of this. So I just want to go back to Lord Justice Davis's point in EasyJet. He says, actually, European Works Councils are a creature of English law now, and the directive is basically irrelevant. Now, I'm slightly puzzled by that for the simple legal reason that I explained um, in the beginning, which was, of course, that um, the uh, regulations, the 99 regulations, were continued into UK law as retained EU law. You might remember I said the reason why the original regulations continued was because of the provisions in the 2018 Act and they were preserved as retained EU law and they were preserved and subject also to all of this stuff. Now, you might also recall on this slide that I showed you um, that while the regs were tweaked to deal with the fact that we were leaving the EU, um, the fact is the basic regs are still there. The 1999 regs are still there. Now, it wasn't just in this field, but in all fields, um, basically huge quantities of EU legislation remained on the statute book. And that huge quantity of, um, uh, of uh, EU law, huge quantity of retained EU law remained on the statute book. And indeed, you might recall that the government said there were about 3,000 pieces I looked this morning, it's gone up to 6,700 pieces um, of retained EU law are still on the UK statute book. And you might also recall that the trust government thought that the process of getting rid of all of that retained EU law, that whole body of retained EU law, um, wasn't going fast enough. And you might recall that um, in the last but one, well, the last leadership, Tory leadership contest, uh, which led to the last but one prime minister, um, both the principal candidates, Rishi Sunak and uh, Liz Truss, tried to outbid each other on how quickly they would get rid of all of that corpus of retained EU law. Um, Rishi Sunak um, uh, made a short video on Twitter where he was seen to be shredding something called EU legislation. So there it is there. And there it's all gone. Um, Liz Truss um, said she was going to scrap all remaining EU laws by the end of 2023. And her Secretary of State said a bonfire of EU laws was easily achieved. It was very quick just to with the stroke of a pen, and indeed the original version of the bill did just that stroke of the pen, um, all retained EU law would go, which of course would have included the 99 regulations. Now, you might also recall there was one hell of a fight over all of this and the effect of the huge backlash from highly contentious organisations like uh, the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and various other um, traditionally um, uh, un, um, 
uh, non-antagonistic organizations was that the government eventually caved and they reversed their default. Their default, as originally um, seen by Rhys Mogg and Liz Truss, was everything must go. In fact, in the ruler 2023, as it's known, the retained EU law revocation um, and reform act, it's known as ruler for short, because it's such a mouthful to say the full thing. In fact, in fact, in fact the sunset was um, reversed, the default was reversed. So everything must stay just as it had done under the 2018 Act, except some provisions listed in the Annex, which don't um, uh, need to concern us here. So in fact, the 1999 regs remain safe, but in the government's desperate attempt to purge anything European from the statute book, the ruler does turn off the principle of supremacy of EU law and the general principles of law. The Act also gives the courts a fairly decent kick um, to be a bit more enthusiastic about departing from pre-Brexit pre um, uh, ECJ case law, which would include the relatively few cases on the European Works Council. Rule, retained EU law becomes assimilated law the terminology doesn't get any better, in other words, to try and drop any reference to EU. So maybe from that point of view, Lord Justice Davis is unwittingly right that we're now talking about British law or English law. Um, and there are very broad powers in the Act to restate, reproduce or revoke um, or replace um, retained EU law now called um, uh, assimilated law. Why is that relevant? Because it is easy to imagine that the government may well discover that um, the TICE regulations are problematic following the EasyJet decision. And so what you'll see is that they will use these very broad powers, which require zero scrutiny, to turn off um, what's left of the 1999 regulations. So what you can see is that the effect of the legislation is to rename retained EU law, get rid of the general principles, get rid of supremacy. And as you can see, all of it is now called assimilated legislation. And that effect, these very generous powers will, could be used um, to turn off um, what's left of the European Works Council uh, uh, legislation, the 1999 regs. That said, I don't want to um, uh, exaggerate the point. The government has used its powers to turn off a number of provisions in the working time regulations uh, and also in the transfer undertakings uh, regulations, but they have not used their powers as yet to touch what's left of the TICE regulations. On that point, I will stop. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. Many thanks, Catherine. Um, yes, well, um, I have to admit my brain is somewhat reeling, um, but I think you've given an extremely comprehensive overview of some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, I know you have to go fairly soon. Are there any questions specifically to Catherine from anybody present uh, before she goes? <laughs> um, I've, ki I've, ki I've killed them with boredom. I've killed them with <laughs> boredom or tedium or <laughs> complete confusion. I hope it's not as bad as that. Um, <laughs> for, from me, if I may, oh, Mark. Marco. Oh, great. Nice to see you. I, are you about? Are you asking the question? Oh, who who spoke just then? That was me, John. Oh, John. Sorry, I didn't see. I, I, didn't I, see I, I mean, I asked the obvious question. Um, do you know of any plans by the government to clear up this bloody mess? <laughs> uh, because uh, I mean, they've got themselves into this position because they had didn't obviously see through the implications of the sort of sweeping uh, decision that they decided to make, no doubt, uh, encouraged by Jacob rees Um, But is there any idea of, of um, pulling it together? Because we may have some opportunities in that particular process 
uh, to sort things out in a rather better position as far as trade unions are concerned. Yes, I, I, when you say sort out this bloody mess, that could be applied to all sorts of aspects of um, of of the Brexit, the post Brexit world we're in. If by that you're referring specifically to the mess created by the um, 2018 Act and the 2023 Act and the um, amendment regs. At the moment, I'm hearing nothing at all. They made a big splash that they were repealing the working time regs, and that's enough to keep the people, their critics, um, on board. In fact, of course, they're not repealing the working time regs. Um, they've made some tweaks um, which aren't um, significant, but um, they have not repealed the working time regs. Um, there's only two bits of um, legislation which is directly labour law related at the moment, um, both of which came into force on the 1st of January 2024, one which dealt with primarily the working time regs, the changes over rolled up holiday pay, for example, and recording requirements, and the other ones on the equality legislation, which is about um, while um, the, the important provision on equal pay has gone, Article 157, uh, they have retained the single source doctrine. So they've been using the powers under the 2023 legislation to be fair at the moment, relatively sparingly. The problem is that the powers under the 23 legislation are so broad um, that the risk is that they could use them to reverse quite a lot of labour law. Now, the government has said repeatedly that they want to respect uh, workers' rights, and indeed they are adding more rights to workers than people got when they were members of the EU. Of course, they were not. it was never, never either or. Um, but at the moment, they're not touching it, but they do have the powers to touch it. And of course, the EasyJet case shows just the problems um, created by this really very complex legal field. Thank you. Yes. Are, are there any other questions? Um, I mean, Catherine, but, but before Brexit, I mean, I, I remember in the run up to the referendum, there were great concerns amongst trade unions about the working time regs that you mentioned. And there were a whole slew of uh, EU related legislation that was concerned. I mean, for example, um, on um, um, uh, um, temporary agencies. Uh, that was one of the areas that was um, considered. I mean, do you have any idea at all about why the government has kind of backtracked on this or doesn't appear to be as keen to repeal this legislation? I think it's a couple of reasons. Um, I think perhaps most interestingly, the EU Commission is watching the UK like a hawk on this subject. Mm. And um, there are what's called level playing field provisions in the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And the level playing field provisions, um, if triggered, lead to very serious consequences for the UK in terms of um, tariffs being imposed on British goods. Now, there are a lot of stages or a number of stages before you get there, but mm. the consequences are really serious uh, if the UK decides to diverge. So um, I think the UK is not actually up for a fight over all of that. And I think the government under Rishi Sunak has taken a policy decision not to carry on with the antagonism that you saw, the antagonistic relationship you saw with Boris Johnson and Lord Frost. And we see the very concrete example of that, which is the uh, agreement to the Windsor framework, um, uh, trying to address some of the issues with the Northern Ireland border. The very fact that they agreed, agreed that in a relatively amicable way suggests that the Sunak government does want to proceed with a, a more... Um, sensible relationship with the UK and is not determined with the EU and is not determined to just dismantle um, the entire labour law framework. Um, I think the second reason is, of course, um, a lot of the red, so-called red wall seats um, actually really like employment rights and employment protection. And mm. um, so mm. the appetite to actually dismantle all of this is probably not that great for uh, electoral reasons. Um, I also think it's partly due to the personalities involved that um, I, I think Sunak is not out to wreck um, uh, in the, quite the same way that his predecessors seem to have been. Mm. OK, thank you. Are there any final questions? Answer came there, none. 
Um, Catherine, I think I know you've got to go. And thank you. I, can I just take this opportunity to thank you again, really wholeheartedly for, for attending. Um, we know you're very busy. Um, and it was an extremely informative talk. You've given us a lot to think about. And um, I'd just like to show my appreciation in the usual way. And I'm sure everybody <laughs> else, blank tiles, um, are doing the same behind their... There we are. Like I can see one or two hands clapping. <laughs> I hope that shows you uh, our appreciation. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll bid you a, a, a fond farewell. And thank good you. luck with your next meeting. Thank you. And th thank and you again. And if there's, if there's, if anyone wants the slides, they'd be helpful. I'm very happy to um to to pass them on. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. That's thanks a million. Great. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Um, right, Jonathan. I think it's over to you. Uh, the timing is actually spot on. Um, if you'd like to uh, get ready yeah. and give your talk, um, you've got about half an hour or whatever, and after that we can have a, a full discussion of the points. Um, plus anything that may still linger from Catherine's talk. So uh, over to you, Jonathan, when you're ready. Yep, thank you, Michael. I'm going to try... There we are, yeah, we can see that well. Is that... Is that is yeah, that that's perfect. Okay? Yeah, yeah that's great, great. Okay, well, I think um, um, Catherine has set the, the scene pretty well, albeit a rather complicated um, <laughs> scene with regards to... Uh, Post Brexit um, and and European Works Councils. I mean, just just as a, a brief introduction, uh, Michael, as you said, I'm the national officer. I mean, the international officer for Unite the Union, and and my role in Unite is to coordinate the activities of our European Works Councils across our 21 different sectors that we represent in. Uh, but predominantly, my uh, main um, role is to negotiate or renegotiate European Works Councils, whether that be um, prior to uh, Brexit or um, currently now. And there are some of the companies that um, I've negotiated or renegotiated at European Works Councils um, uh, with. Look, I'm going to start my um, presentation, really, in order to demonstrate the impact and the significant um, impact of, of um, Brexit on European Works Councils. I think it's important that I set the scene of where we were prior um, to Brexit. And I'm not going to go into the litigation of what Catherine did about the TICE regulations at all, but I just want to show you this particular um, slide, because if you look at the introduction of the Recast Directive in 2011, which was the upgraded version of the original uh, 1996 directive, um, you know, I and many other unions and many other commentators and practitioners practitioners really adopted a very proactive litigation strategy with regards to European Works Councils. And what I mean with that is that we tried to ensure that companies properly comply with their legal obligations to inform and consult. And if they didn't inf properly inform and consult in accordance with their obligations, we made it clear to them that we would be challenging them in the CAC, in the uh, the legal um, aspect. And that did two things. First of all, we did take a number of companies to court and we did prove that the interpretation of the TICE regulations and the directive was much more in line with the trade union perspective, especially in regards to um, information and consultation prior to decisions being taken, the right for European Works Councils to use experts of their choice at the cost of the employer, um, the broader definition of transnationality, not just when a decision impacted or affected those employees directly, but those indirectly uh, affected by a decision were within scope of transnationality. And also the fact that companies, if a European Works Council took a company to court, um, they would be required to pay for those legal costs. Yeah, because the uh, EWC didn't have their own um, finances in which to do that. And so you can see that we were really in an ascendancy to change the dynamics of European Works Council now they operated from a pre-2011 meet once a year at an annual meeting to proper information and consultation on an ongoing basis where companies knew 
that they had to at least attempt to inform and consult European Works Councils, which included UK uh, workers, on decisions that impacted on their employment. And that gave us a significant uh, improvement in information consultation right for UK workers, because I'm sure everybody on the call is aware our information and consultation rights in the UK are pretty poor. And it was European Works Council legislation that actually enabled us to try and hold for the first time um, companies uh, to account. But then Brexit obviously happened and the proactive strategy, unfortunately, had to be developed into a reactive strategy because no longer were we able to utilise the legal provisions and the legal rights that we had to pursue and to ensure companies informed and consulted properly, it was more of a concern about just maintaining our presence within European Works Councils um, in these instances. And we developed a reactive strategy in two aspects. First of all, very much in line with what Catherine was alluding to, the fact that there was in place the tight regulations, they didn't repeal them, uh, which did give uncertainty um, on the legal jurisdiction issue. And also the broader aspect, which is probably uh, what other colleague, what colleagues are interested on the call about, the negotiation aspect of trying to keep the UK um, involved in and participate in uh, European um, works councils. So if I take the first uh, aspect, which really does, um, you know, uh, coincide with what Catherine was um, referring to. At the point of Brexit on the 31st of January 2020, it was unclear whether companies that had agreements under UK law prior to Brexit Day were required to continue to apply the TICE regulations. As Catherine said, the wording proposed or amended by the government was unclear on whether central management remained in the UK post-Brexit compared to what it did uh, prior to Brexit. And as she said, um, we did have the EasyJet case. We also had uh, HSBC, which is another case that's still being um, run currently, where they did rule that the UK would no longer be part of their European Works Council agreement, but that was on the wording within the agreement rather than the subsidiary requirements that Catherine alluded to. And I don't want to get into too much technicalities about um, the two, but the advice to our officers and representatives was because of the uncertainty, do not automatically agree to change your agreement to allow companies to de-designate the UK. As, as Catherine alluded to, there was a requirement to nominate another a member state for jurisdiction in accordance with the directive but that didn't mean you automatically were able to de-designate the UK and therefore remove yourself from the TICE regulations which obviously for us as a trade union was important because the TICE regulations guaranteed UK participation in the European Works Councils. We weren't really particularly cared whether it was practically possible to have two European Works Councils or not providing UK workers were involved in one of them and if a company had to apply or um, operate to that was their issue we were willing to negotiate agreements uh, that would just be under one jurisdiction uh, providing the uk uh, was involved and in fact we were able to utilize that legal uncertainty to go to companies and saying look we're unclear about whether the uk applies to you or not if you want to move to a new jurisdiction and de-designate the UK, we are happy to help you with that and renegotiate your agreement. But on the backside of that and in exchange for that, we want to guarantee provisions within that agreement that the UK continues to participate. So in essence, what we would do if a company wanted to move their European Works Council to Irish law, we would amend the agreement or agree to amend the agreement to Irish law, but we would put provisions in there that the UK would remember, remain part of the scope of that European Works Council agreement. So the uncertainty actually gave us an opportunity because it did mean that we were able to negotiate um, with companies 
the inclusion of UK um, um, representation and participation. Now, if I'm going to move on to um, the, the negotiation part of it and, and away a little bit from the UK legislation and the dog's dinner or dog's breakfast, as Catherine alluded to, which is an extremely complicated um, situation, we do have the, the broader aspect about, well, how do we negotiate and what do we do with the negotiation? What were the practicalities in our experience about keeping UK participation in, in both UK-based EWCs or prior UK-based EWCs and non-UK-based uh, EWCs? Well, certainly the solidarity aspect from the federations and European fellow European unions was critical. All of them at the time came out with very pro-UK uh, involvement. Um, many of them, if not all of them, had policies that if um, trade unions or trade union officers were negotiating or renegotiating agreements, they should include the UK and not discard the UK, and that should be a top priority. So that gave us real sense of solidarity. I can't deny that in many circumstances, there was some negativity um, in European Works Councils from many fellow uh, European uh, colleagues and representatives because there was a general bitterness, if I'm being totally honest with you, from many of them that the UK had decided to leave the, the EU. And there was a general sense that if you wanted to leave the EU, then you, you leave you made your bed, you lie in it. If you don't get the rights of the European Works Council directive, you don't you don't get it. And uh, um, there was some colleagues that felt quite, um, you know, passionate about uh, that aspect and whether they wanted the UK involved um, in the future European Works Councils. I mean, on a practical note, removing the UK often gave extra seats to other European colleagues because the dilution of the UK out of it meant that the um, the percentages of employee numbers increased in other member states and therefore they would get an increased um, number of seats. So there was a genuine, you know, um, um, appetite in some circumstances to kick the UK out from our own uh, colleagues. But I think in the end, pragmatism kicked in. Um, and once we sat down and had a discussion with many of our colleagues, they realised that having the UK in rather than out was pragmatically better than um, um, seeing the UK removed from the scope of the European Works Council. Maybe on two, two reasons. First of all, they didn't want management there then to start playing the UK off against fellow colleagues because they weren't part of the discussions. But secondly, and more importantly, that the transnational transnationality aspect is very important because you take the UK out of the two member states affected, then you reduce the level of scope for information and consultation. And a lot of colleagues realised that the UK and a lot of companies was a significant player in the business. And if you took them out of the scope of the European Works Council, it reduced their ability to be informed and consulted about decisions because they would be outside the scope of transnationality. So even on a practical point of view, colleagues from across Europe knew that having the UK was having them better, it was better to have them in than out for both the reasons um, that I've highlighted uh, here. Now, if we look at um, the actual options adopted by companies with regards to the UK uh, participation, there was kind of generally four. The first one, was to remove them completely from the scope. Uh, and we have HPE, HP Inc, Caterpillar, IBM, HSBC. And as you can see there, the International Airlines Group, which is the parent company of British Airways, uh, which was particularly disappointing considering that British Airways and the UK make up 62% of the total group employee population of IAG. But on the day of Brexit, they removed them completely unilaterally from um, the EWC uh, agreement. Now, that could be down to historical, cultural, um, adversarial industrial relations with the UK unions and British Airways management, which is probably the case. It was a vindictive 
um, move. But you had many European Works Councils or many managements of European Works Councils that would adopt option one, which would remove the UK in its entirety from its European um, Works Council. You then had the second um, kind of option where companies agreed to keep the UK in either as guests or observers, but would remove them from the scope of transnationality. So therefore, they refused to um, inform and consult about UK aspects, and they would not include them in the trigger mechanisms or the threshold mechanisms for triggering exceptional circumstances, and often removed them from any information and consultation at an annual meeting. The third option was that the UK would be observers or guests, but would be within the scope of transnationality and if a decision or proposal that affected the UK, that would trigger exceptional circumstances, that would trigger information and consultation, and the UK could, could, could form part of that information and consultation um, uh, process. The big difference with option three was that in most cases, the company decided how many employee how many employee representatives would come from the uk they would be outside the threshold mechanism for designating representatives from the broader uh, body of um uh, the rest of, uh, of rest of europe and there would be a specific um, um appointment or selection or election process that would be connected to that but often in the circumstances of point three companies would insist that UK representatives couldn't be on the select committee, for example, or couldn't be a chair or vice chair of the European Works Council. So there's often provisions attached to it. And then the final one was the obviously one that we tried to negotiate as best we could, which would keep uh, the UK in as full members um, as much as possible. And, you know, for Westinghouse, GE, SPX Floor, Rolls-Royce, and many others, uh, that was the case and that uh, still remains the case. Now, we haven't got much analysis really on um, the level of how many UK representatives are in European Works Councils, who aren't, who's been kicked out, who hasn't been kicked out. The only research we have so far has been done by Industrial Europe and they've analysed best they can, their European Works Councils. Industrial Europe has the largest uh, number of um, EWCs of all the uh, European trade union federations. Uh, they have the probably the, the most um, um, established structure for dealing with European Works Councils. They actually have part of the secretariat that looks after the coordination of European Works Councils. And so far, this is the only information that we have available uh, to us. As you can see from the pie chart, the majority is that we don't have information of the 200, 422, 233 we're still unaware of. But what we can do, we can analyse the um, 189 or so European Works Councils that have given information on uh, the current status of UK representation and participation in their European Works Councils. Um, 116 have kept the UK in as full members. 26 um, as guests and 44 um, have removed the UK totally from the scope of their European Works Council. So if you look at that, it's about 61% of European Works Councils uh, under the jurisdiction of industrial Europe that have kept um, uh, UK representatives in there. If I was speculating on the other 233, and the other federations that I deal with, especially in the service sector, I don't think it would be as high as 61%. I think it would be less than that. I would be happy if it was 50% of, of management that kept Europe, uh, UK um, in uh, European Works Councils um, uh, uh, currently. So then we move on to, well, where do we kind of go um, from here? Um, I mean, the, the, the one thing that we have noticed and from our experience have recognised is that if you can just keep the UK in, in any form, it gives us opportunities. Even in European Works Council agreements now 
that I've been part of the negotiation which have kept the UK as observers or state or guest status, but are outside the scope of transnationality. Even at annual meetings, they will generally include UK information within their um, presentations. Um, and also as well, having a seat at the table does enable uh, you to ask questions and still raise issues that concern the UK. And in the majority of cases, um, management is happy to engage in that. They're still very reluctant to include them when you're in them circumstances, in any exceptional circumstances, but will generally provide information and consult in some form um, at an annual meeting um, with uh, the European Works Councils. It is also an opportunity um, to then enhance the UK status within them uh, EWCs. And I have had circumstances and situations where the UK representation has started off as observers um, and uh, guest status, and we have been able um, to put or get them to full member status and fully covered. So the it, having a foot in the door is definitely a better opportunity than having no foot in the door um, whatsoever. Uh, with regards to um, the negotiation, uh, but by the way, with regards to continued negotiation in current EWCs, I do suspect as well that when the mandate for an EWC time comes up, a period comes up, there's going to be discussions at that time about the continued participation of of the UK. So I think this is not just a set in stone, they're either in or out. I think there will be ongoing negotiations with regards to the continued participation of, of the UK in legacy existing EWCs. When it comes to the negotiation of new European Works Councils, I think this is um, a little bit more problematic, um, mainly because the while the directive and um, uh, national domestic legislation in the various countries allows for the SMB, uh, Special Negotiating Body, or an EWC, to agree and negotiate uh, to extend the scope of the European Works Council Agreement to countries outside the EEA. When it comes to an SMB, it's specific that it is only EEA members that have a seat on the Special Negotiating Body. So at the outset, there is no UK representation in the Special Negotiating Body. Now, this is problematic because, first of all, their issue of the UK is less prominent because there's no one there actually raising that concern or that issue. Um, secondly, um, from my experience, the reason why many colleagues from across Europe wanted to keep the UK in their European Works Council previously is because they knew them. They were friends. They'd worked together. They were work colleagues. And there was a general loyalty um, in legacy and existing EWCs to keep the UK in. When you haven't got that friendship, when you haven't got that built, those relationships, uh, whether other European colleagues are going to go out on a limb to help negotiate or negotiate the UK in, I think it's questionable. Um, the one thing that we have found, and this is a red line for certainly United and many other UK unions, we're not allowing companies to try and negotiate the UK into an agreement on the basis of concessions. So in some negotiations that I've been involved in, companies have come to the, SM, the special negotiating body and said, look, if you agree to virtual meetings, for example, we will allow the UK to participate in the EWC. And we've made it clear it is our fault from a UK perspective that we voted for Brexit, and it should not be our colleagues in Europe that dilute their rights um, in order to accommodate something that we did uh, in the UK. So that's a kind of red light. But many companies are trying that to negotiate provisions that uh, weaken the EWC agreement on the basis that the UK can continue to participate. I suspect for both points one and two, um, and Catherine alluded to the revision or the proposed re revision of the directive. And she's right, the text isn't out yet. We did expect the text to be out last week, but it's going to be out either this week or next week, the proposals from the Commission. But I suspect if we do, if the Commission does go down the line of strengthening the directive, then, you know, um, lawyers 
like Lewis Silkin that um, um, Catherine alluded to that predominantly advise employers um, that they're going to be saying, look, reduce your risk of being exposed to a stronger directive by reducing the participation of, of the UK. So I think that could have actually a negative impact on the UK moving forward, a stronger directive because it will encourage uh, UK uh, um, employers to remove the, the UK for the reason I referred to earlier, which is the transnationality aspect and broadening the scope um, for information and consultation. Um, but the third point is on a political point. Um, and I know we were talking about, or Catherine was referring to uh, the fact that, you know, there wasn't a massive burning of uh, EU law um, that followed, um, you know, Brexit and the various um, different uh, conservative regimes and administration. Um, but it's highly likely and hopefully that we're going to get a Labour government in place by the end of the year. And I think that does um, create different opportunities and possibilities. Uh, for example, um, I can't see any reason why, if in principle, the European Commission and the UK government uh, agreed that the UK employees could be covered within the scope of a European Works Council directive, albeit, and obviously you couldn't establish EWCs under UK law, but UK employees could be covered within um, member states' EWC agreements. I can't see if both the ETUC and the Europe and the UK unions fought for that, why that would be totally unacceptable from both parties. I think that could be um, a discussion um, that that uh, that could take place that, that could uh, give us those opportunities. Obviously, keeping the protections um, for European Works Council members of the UK in place uh, for discrimination, detriment and all the other bits and pieces. So that could be uh, an opportunity um, moving forward. And, you know, the, the UK, potentially, UK government could strengthen the TICE regulations um, in a more domestic, national um, um, position rather than a, a European position. And what I mean by that, we all know that the information consultation regulations were poorly written and poorly delivered and basically are unworkable, but you could amend the TICE regulations in a more national UK context uh, to give UK workers far greater rights equivalent to those um, within Europe, albeit from a national or domestic um, point of view. So look, Michael, that was kind of um, my overview about where we are practically um, and some of the challenges um, that we face. I didn't want to go into too much detail because it's a very complex area, um, as Catherine pointed out. Um, but I do think there is, you know, um, an opportunity. Um, I do. I don't think we're just going to get excluded from European Works Council working with our colleagues moving forward. And it's important that we are all on the same page to ensure, um, you know, that, that we do realise how important these bodies are. Are. As, I, as I started with my first one, I think the biggest frustration for me is that finally we started to get the opportunity to hold companies to account from a UK and from a trade union perspective, from a UK perspective. And we've lost those opportunities through this. But it doesn't mean that we lose all our opportunities um, in the future. And I'm happy to take any questions or, or general discussion points, Michael, uh, that any of the colleagues um, have got um, uh, of interest. But uh, thanks very much.